My guest today is Brian Krasinski. Brian, how are you? Pretty good. How about you? I'm doing great. It's so great to have you back on my show after, I don't know, a decade, I think. It's the last time you were here. Yeah. Yeah, I think I was quite nervous back then. <laughs> uh, I hope you've recovered. <laughs> I hope so, too. <laughs> what are you doing these days for a living? Uh, primarily work, uh, a lot, doing a lot of machine learning stuff. Uh, more recently, uh, getting back into C Sharp after doing Python for a while, and I'm really happy, yeah. really loving it. Um, you were, so you were doing Python because of the machine learning, I imagine. So yeah. Huge, popular language for data science. Yeah, so that was one of the frustrations I had around you know 2020 was uh, I basically had to make a decision. Do I stick with C Sharp or do I want to stick with machine learning? I was kind of bummed that I couldn't really do both. Um, yeah. So I kind of went the machine learning route, but now I'm back to doing uh, machine learning with C Sharp. So I'm really happy about that. Machine learning with C Sharp, that used to be really difficult to do. It, you had to learn Python or R, I think, are the two big languages. Uh, and that's a barrier to a lot of people, you know, learning a whole yeah. new language in addition to the, you know, the paradigms of machine learning. Uh, but that's, has the technology changed? Is that what's going on? Yeah, there's actually a lot of different options you have today. Uh, so, for example, if you're somebody just getting into machine learning and you're a developer, uh, you know, machine learning or ML.net uh, has really come a long way since it came out in 2017. Um, if you're somebody who, you know, is already a data scientist or works with data science teams, uh, there's stuff like the SciSharp stack, um, you know, which is basically... Uh, either wrappers or out and out ports of different uh, Python or different uh, frameworks for machine learning in Python, but ported to C sharp. Uh, so like TensorFlow, Keras, uh, NumPy, Pandas, PyTorch, all that stuff you can now write in C sharp uh, using those frameworks, uh, those basically those NuGet packages. It's oh, really, very really cool. cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about that. So these are, are these open source uh, ports? Yep. Uh, yep. These frameworks? Yep. Uh, so basically, there's two different ways that it works. Some of them are ports, like for example, NumPy. Uh, there's um, basically two versions of it. There's NumPy, NumPy.net, and then there's NumSharp. NumPy.net is basically a wrapper that lets you use the Python code uh, to call the actual NumPy library to actually make the you know make the call. So it has 100% of the features in there. Uh, there's also a port of the NumPy library called NumPy, NumSharp. And NumSharp is basically where they took in, it's about 98% the same features. And okay. they've taken all that and made it a native port of that. So it runs natively in C Sharp. There's no calling out to Python or any of that kind of stuff. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah, it's really cool. Uh, yeah, which, are, which one of these are you using? Um, so... Uh, so it depends on your on your uh, project. Um, so a lot of our projects, we actually have data science teams. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll have like people de designated just for doing the modeling. Um, so a lot of them all work in Python. Uh, okay. So so their environment is primarily like you know, Jupyter notebooks and uh, and pandas and and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the, the challenge comes in and that's kind of the one of the big things I want to talk about today is, OK, so now we have a model how do we use it, right? How do we get it into our code and how do we get this thing deployed, right? So, you know, when you have a split stack like this, where now, you know, we're trying to take Python and we're trying to put it into uh, C Sharp, uh, you know, now it poses a lot of challenges, right? If we wanted to, uh, you know, just take the model directly. So one of the big things I wanted to talk about was uh, Onyx. Uh, Onyx is O-N-N-X. It stands for the Open Neural Network Exchange. Uh, so basically what this is, is it's a, if you think about it like this, it's like a JSON of your model um, and you can build it in whatever you want and then run it in whatever else you want. So for example, mm -hmm. if I like TensorFlow in, in Python, I can build my model there. I can port it to an Onyx file and then I can run it in my C Sharp application. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. So it has basically, it's, a, it's not only a format for the actual file specification that gets created for the model. Uh, but it's also a runtime so that I can run that Python model in my C Sharp code without having to take any Python dependencies. So I don't have to have Python installed. I don't have to pip install, you know, PyTorch and all those other dependencies outside of my application. 
Um, so I can actually take that model, drop it right in there. So Onyx is typically my preferred approach um, okay. uh, for a lot of my MLEs. Um, I say you can do whatever you want, use whatever frameworks you want, whatever. Uh, just give me an Onyx file in the end. Uh, and Onyx actually has a lot of cool uh, abilities with that too, because now once I have an Onyx file, I could take that and I can use it in ML.net. I could take that and I can host it in uh, Azure Machine Learning and basically have a cloud hosted version or a wrapper to my model. Hmm. Uh, so I don't create a service and everything around that. Uh, so I actually have a lot of power and, and uh, flexibility by using something like Onyx. So Onyx is something that I that I'm I, I really try to promote because I don't think a lot of people are familiar with it. I'm not. Uh, but yeah, it, it was created back in like 2017 by a collaboration between Microsoft and uh, Facebook because they both had this problem where uh, number one that you know everybody likes to code in Python for their machine learning stuff, right. um, but also. Um, you know, a lot of people like different frameworks, right? So if this guy likes TensorFlow, that guy likes PyTorch, um, you know, somebody could build a model in TensorFlow, bring it into PyTorch, and then, then build a, you know, a model off of that model doing something like transfer learning. Uh, so it's actually really cool, uh, really cool capabilities of, uh, you know, with that. So you actually have a lot of power and flexibility. So it's, it sounds like the reason this is, has such appeal to you is uh, because you're working on a team and so this is really what's designed for. You're working on a team. You'd want to, you don't want to dictate to them what language and what frameworks and what platforms they're using. And you don't want them dictating to you. And yeah. so Onyx became, becomes the glue that gets that kind of ties it all together. Yeah, exactly. Uh, they, 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 they do their thing. They build their model. They export it to Onyx. You consume that Onyx model in your preferred language, right? Is that, is that the – have I got the model, the, the, the paradigm in my head correct? Yep, exactly. Uh, so one of the big things with that is I'm a firm believer in um, using the right tool for the job. And Python is really good because of all the uh, ecosystem and the frameworks yeah. and stuff that are yep. in it for machine learning. But it's really not when you're trying to do enterprise level applications with it. Uh, you run into a lot of problems because a lot of things that we take for granted, things like dependency injection, you know, mm -hmm. separating things out into different projects and files. Or building uh, a user interface. <laughs> exactly. A lot of that stuff becomes really hard in Python uh, because the tooling and stuff just isn't there like it is in C Sharp. Yeah. Um, so that's why I really love it because it, it gives me the ability to say, hey, I'm going to let you use the best tool for your job. I'm going to use the best tool for my job. And together we're going to make something awesome. I love it. Is Onyx, is that a, a standard uh, now? Has the industry adopted this? Um. Yeah, I'm trying to. I think essentially a lot of things have have adopted it. So, for example, like if I create an Onyx model in Python, um, I could take it and put it in uh, Azure um, Azure Machine Learning, uh, AWS SageMaker. Um, okay. I could use it with different frameworks. So, yeah, there's a lot. It, it, I would say, like in machine learning, there's a lot of uh, adoption of it. Okay. Um, outside of like outside of that, like people like wanting to. Uh, you know, integrate into their applications. I don't think a lot of people are aware of it. Um, but even but even with ML.net, I could actually go in ML.net. I could build a model there, and I could still again uh, export it to an Onyx file, and then I could even take that code and run it in Python now. Uh, excellent. Yeah, I guess what I'm thinking is uh, the of course Microsoft and Facebook are probably good at integrating this stuff because since they built it. Uh, but if somebody you mentioned AWS, uh, if they're using it in their services, then that's, you know, it's another giant company. If Google is using it in some of their services, or if, uh, I don't know, Brian's open source framework is using it in his, you know, is there if the, that kind of broad adoption? It makes it a lot easier. You know, I can say, I can say, yeah, I've got this model. I've built it. You don't have to build four different versions of the model, depending on the platform. You can just put it out into this, I'll put finger quotes around the word standard. Uh, because sometimes yeah. things are just generally accepted before some standards organization even renders an opinion on that, which can be slow sometimes. Uh, but it sounds like that's the case here, that they, they have become uh, at least a de facto standard. Yeah, yeah, essentially that's what it is. Is like uh, So if you think about like a neural network, it's mm -hmm. basically just a graph, like the, you know, the computer science graph. Like back in the day, you know, you have nodes and you have edges between the nodes. Uh, that's all it really is, is basically that with weights on the edges. Okay. Um, so it's, it's, so it's a standardized, uh, standardization of that graph structure 
uh, into like a common format. So I guess in a way it is a kind of a standard uh, where they're saying, well, okay, so in Keras you build your, your your networks this way, but in PyTorch you build them that way. We really don't care. There's just a translator that goes from PyTorch to Onyx or Keras to Onyx or TensorFlow to Onyx. Uh, and then that handles all that translation for you. Excellent. Um, they, you were talking uh, off camera about uh, the issues when you wanted to run these models locally as opposed to in the cloud. I mean, was, most models are built in the cloud these days. I think that's a fair statement just because of the capacity that people don't have these supercomputers anymore. They, they'll deploy them to something like Azure or AWS and build them. But to consume them, you don't need that kind of superpower. It, it all depends on what you're building, to be honest with you. Um, so some of the so a lot of the work that we're doing is document classification and document extraction. Uh, so our company uh, will will store a lot of physical media, like let's say you know microfilm or microfiche, that kind of stuff, and we'll actually digitize that that film. Hmm. Uh, we'll convert that into documents, and then we want to do classification and extraction across those. Uh, so some of our models for extraction can actually be quite large. Um, so even though, uh, you know, traditionally you would say, yeah, I'm going to use a GPU for, for training and I'm going to use a CPU for, for, uh, inference or, you know, prediction time. Um, but sometimes depending on the type of model, you might use a GPU for both. Uh, so there's, there's some vision models like YOLO that like you can still accelerate and use that with that, which is another cool thing about Onyx is that Onyx, um, actually supports all these standard, uh, optimization uh, frameworks like uh, like Tensor RT and uh, some of the other ones. I, f I forget the, the list of them off the top of my head. Uh, but it has like CUDA support and GPU support and everything built in. So all I'd have to do is add a NuGet package to my uh, to my to my pack or to my uh, project. That's the Onyx runtime with the GPU support. And that's all I have to do. And mm -hmm. I automatically have that. I don't have to set up CUDA and all that other stuff. I so love the simplicity all. of it. Yeah, that yeah, me awesome. as well. Yeah, me as well. I, I, I definitely love that. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about deployment. Um, so like, you know, when a lot of people get into machine learning, especially if you're just, you know, starting out, um, you know, it seems simple. Like, you know, it just like you, you can go to like the cloud, you can go to like something like Google Colab or um, I, I forget. There's a, there's a version of something like that, like uh, like Azure Notebooks and stuff. What is what is the latest version of something like that? I, I can't speak to the latest version, but there is a, an Azure Notebook, which is essentially Jupyter Notebooks hosted yeah. inside of Azure. Yeah, so like that that's a perfect place for people to get started if they're trying to um, you know build models that way. Uh, so you can actually build models there. You can actually host them in like Azure Machine Learning, uh, things like that. Um, but, you know, what the challenge really comes is like uh, building the model and that kind of thing is really not that difficult, right? What is difficult is getting good data, uh, knowing your data is uh, labeled correctly uh, and all set up properly. Right. Um, then you get the fun stuff of doing the, uh, the the actual machine learning, you know, building the model. That's what, ev that's what everybody wants to do. Yeah. But to me, I, that's only... I've, that's I've only... heard this, that data scientists spend the bulk of their time cleaning up their data. Exactly. Yeah. What they call data munging. Munging. Uh, data. Yeah. <laughs> Good word. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah. So then you got, you know, the fun stuff of wanting to build a model, which is what everybody wants to do. Uh, but then at the end of the day, you know, let's say you build a perfect model. Well, if you don't, if you're not able to integrate that easily into the, your code then it's basically useless, right? So let's say you build your model in Python. It's, you know, it works really good. It meets all your metrics that you want to do. But now let's say you're a C-sharp company. Well, how do you integrate that, right? You know, like, you know, Python and C-sharp aren't, you know, necessarily 100% compatible. So like, that's where a lot of those challenges and stuff come from. And that's why, you know, having things like, you know, cloud hosted models uh, is really good. You know, like add, like basically taking your Onyx file we talked about and dropping it into uh, Azure Machine Learning. Uh, that now gives you a service you can call. So now your integration is really easy. You just make a REST call up to that up to that service. Totally is. Might be a little latency latency issue though in that area. Yeah, and and, and that's one of the things with machine learning is um, depends on how you're trying to utilize it because most machine learning applications are not running in real time. 
Um, if you're like walking around with a camera and it's identifying objects, that's a real time example. Yeah. Um, but most things are not done in real time. Uh, okay. Like, let's say, for example, even going back to the document classification we're talking about just a little bit ago. Yeah. Um, if I have a 5,000 page document, that's not realistic for me to assume that I'm going to be able to do everything with that in real time, right? Because right. I might have to open every page. I might have to OCR every page to get the text. I need to take the text, pass it into, you know, whatever many text models we have for machine learning, uh, make our make our classification. Then I need to pass it over to my extraction models, let it extract based upon those classifications. Um, and then I need to take all those results back and then do something with it, right? You know, give it to you in a nice format to say, okay, here's the representation of the data for that document. Now go do with it what you want. And if you have like a 5,000 page document, that's not going to be in real time. Necessarily, that'll take a latency, just the process itself. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, I mean, OCR, for example, is like, you know, you're looking at at least, um, I think it's about at least a second per page, even to call like one of the cloud services. Uh, so you really have to, uh, you know, really account for a lot of that. And, that. and that's one of the challenges about being an architect on the machine learning side is it's not necessarily like, you know, when we have line of business applications, it's a lot, it's pretty easy and pretty straightforward, right? We uh, develop locally, we test locally against the test database, we write tests, um, everything's good to go, we could push it up, right? Uh, but with machine, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What could go wrong? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> Worked on my test machine. <laughs> But with machine learning, you have a lot of additional challenges like, you know, does the model work correctly? Uh, does the code work correctly? Uh, getting both of those deployed. And sometimes, you know, like if you're on premises, uh, not in the cloud, then you're like, you might have to create Docker containers for your models. And let's say that your application has like 50 models, right? So now that's like 50 Docker instances you have to, you have to uh, deploy. Uh, and then maybe you want several instances of each of those running. So now you need Kubernetes. So now you're adding a lot of additional structure and complexity to your application um, that you don't necessarily have to deal with when you have just a normal a normal line of business app mm -hmm. uh, because you could just say, okay, well, here's my app, go throw it in a Docker container and then load, load it into your Kubernetes cluster um, where I or on the machine learning side, I have to do that within the context of my application of like, you know, now, now, okay, so now I have 50 instances of this single model running which one do I call? So now I need to build something in there that acts as like a load balancer um, to actually, you know, uh, to actually catch that, you know? Yeah. Very cool. Lots of challenges uh, in yeah. machine learning, which is, which is why it's a field in high demand right now, or one of the reasons, anyway. Yeah, I feel like everyone's trying to get into it because uh, there's so much power and, and, and ability with it. Um, I think some, some companies are just trying to chase buzzwords. Uh, and they're trying to That's trying true. to do ML, yeah, trying to do ML when they really don't need it. Yeah. Um, but I also feel like companies like ours, like we, uh, you know, we do a lot of document processing. Like the project that I we I just finished up, uh, we did um, document processing of about two billion documents, mm -hmm. and that kind of creates a lot of challenge too that we don't normally have with our normal applications because now we're working with big data, right? So now you know we have to take our models. And we might even have to load them into like uh, something like Hadoop. And now we build the Hadoop processes where we can, you know, run it across, you know, these, you know, X amount of documents at a time so we can get the, the bandwidth and stuff that we need. And those are kind of the challenges that people don't think about when you get into machine learning is that with, with big data, uh, you know, you get a lot of additional challenges. Um, machine learning just brings a lot to the table in terms of like uh, complexity. Uh, versus just a normal application. Makes sense. With big data comes big responsibility. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, what you described here, this uh, reading of documents and classifying the information and, and uh, what you say, billions of pages, billions of documents, that's that's an ideal for a machine learning. Because we could see you and I could spend our entire lives trying to read through billions of documents. We wouldn't come close to finishing that project. Yeah, um, never. <laughs> uh, machine learning is, is exactly... Kind of, that's exactly the kind of problem machine learning was invented for. Um, is there anything we haven't talked about that we should, you feel we should have on this call? Um, I think that was pretty much the high level of uh, okay. of what I was thinking. Um, and you're speaking I, on this, right, in the, at conferences and user groups and so forth? Yeah, yeah, I do have a whole talk around how to do machine learning in C-sharp and uh, cover a lot of these type, types of things, but a little bit more in depth. 
Um, Where Where's your next speaking gig? Uh, I actually don't know yet. Okay. Um, I, I applied for uh, KCDC. Uh, a lot of That's the Tennessee conf- Yep. A lot of the Tennessee conferences aren't happening this year. Yeah. Um. So uh, just waiting to hear back. You know, here uh, open for like DevUp and uh, Code Palooza and some of the other ones. I might see you at those. Uh, Brian, thanks so much for your time. I learned a lot today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. David, thank you for having me today. Uh, it's been great sharing new technology with old friends and uh, look forward to seeing uh, how you uh, adapt some of this technology into your, into your work.